always but three we have away. Well, I'm mindful of the time is 12 30. Um, I want to uh, thank everyone for attending the, I think the fifth of our colloquial series. And uh, today we get to turn our attention to an area that we've not highlighted that's the, the issue of uh, public health, uh, medicine, nursing, and human rights. Um, so we're delighted uh, to be able to have this presentation that it incorporates not just uh, a discussion about the issue that's of uh, importance here in our area, but also a methodology as well uh, that's uh, a very interesting methodology and has lots of applications, I think, in, in lots of different disciplines. Um, we're very for, uh, happy to have partnered uh, on this particular uh, project in terms of helping to produce some of the photographs um, and are very excited to uh, be able to now hear some of the narrative and some of the content with it. Uh, my name is Stephen Roper, I'm the Executive Director of the Peace, Justice, and Human Rights Initiative. Um, and so let me just very briefly introduce, uh, we've got uh, four speakers today, um, and I'm mindful of our time, and I know people will want to have uh, some time for uh, the Q&A. So um, let me just go through very uh, briefly and just uh, introduce everyone. Uh, first off, we have uh, Dr. Susan Dice with us, who's been a uh, nurse for 31 years and practicing critical care, oncology, uh, and big community settings. Her philosophy for teaching combines health, uh, human care, and transformational um, teamwork that facilitates student uh, educational success and professional maturation. Uh, her most passionate interest is developing others' enthusiasm for the journey of holistic practice, which you might see here represented today, um, in the nursing profession. Uh, and her research interests are holistic leadership and community-based nursing practice. Uh, Dr. Pat Lear, um, is an active research, uh, has an active research program that's been developed over two decades with particularly Japanese colleagues. Uh, the current work of uh, the research team focuses on the creative dissemination of findings from a study of health stories from Pearl Harbor and uh, Hiroshima survivors, where wartime narratives were gathered and analyzed with the guidance from story theory, uh, middle range theory developed uh, by Dr. Lear. Uh, Kate Morris, who's been the collaborator in those projects, is a playwright here uh, at FAU on the research team. And facilitated the translation of those stories. This skill to form approach uh, that we'll be talking a little bit to today was established uh, a foundation for the work that's being presented. Nancy Stein um, is a cultural anthropologist with an in, uh, interest in visual anthropology. Uh, Dr. Stein serves how people represent and communicate their world views. Uh, her research interests focus on the relationship between humans and visual culture that surrounds them, as well as visual methodologies, collaboration, public anthropology, human rights and applied projects outside of academia. Um, so um, last summer she faced her first uh, short film documenting the uniqueness of drag culture in Manchester, England. You've got to see that. Um, her first book, Images of Human Rights, which uh, we have some copies here, uh, Local and Global Perspective, was recently published. Uh, and this summer she'll be doing initial field work on a collaborative project um, in on the island of Mytilene, Mytilene, Greece, which I'm going to collaborate with her on. Uh, among the various populations of locals, volunteers, refugees, and NGOs. Uh, and Andra Olinsky uh, is uh, works in uh, clinical work and research has intersected community health and population health with the concerns related to peace, justice, and human rights by expressing compassion, respect, and building a community of inclusion for individuals who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, providing health care for those experiencing homelessness is a beautiful expression of caring. Uh, that leads to an avenue for honoring the dignity of others. Her research has uh, addressed the life strain and health burden of experiencing homelessness and uses this film to inform the approach that we'll be talking about today for the dissemination of the findings. So, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Stein. Well, welcome, and on that note, I'm going to turn it over to you. And we're done. Actually, I'm going to be objective. Oh, you okay. I love it. I love it. I can share yeah. with you. Yeah. Well, you see what the objective are. We just felt like it was appropriate for us to give you a sense of where we're headed here because there's a lot of information that we're sharing. And so we're going to explore peace, justice, human rights, signature theme of uh, inequality and social inclusion as it is related to homelessness. Come on in. We're just getting started. We're going to explain the field of work approach. Dr. Lear is going to really help us with that. We're going to also describe an academic practice collaboration, uh, describe the uh, evolution of this team. It was a, a very wonderful evolution that was uh, not forced. It was very natural. We're 
and imagine um, different linkages for research as they fit with the university goals. And when we imagine, we're going to invite you to imagine that with us and uh, examine the concept, the phenomena of human connection that really has emerged from here, uh, this research, and then elaborate with this course related to the future uh, peace, justice, human rights uh, research. Thanks. Okay, so I think I can start. Yes. Oh, and Dr. Laird's taking it over. <laughs> <laughs> she can with the function. So, um, yes, my role in this project has been to connect nursing with the arts. So it's kind of a, a yeah, and that being Susan and uh, and Andra with Nancy is <laughs> how that, and it actually happens that I have it for her. <laughs> it happened that, you know, but I, I point that out simply because I think that, you know, serendipitously sometimes, if you know people from other colleges, uh, so I saw Mike Harris in anthropology at a habit worker and said, do you know anybody in the field of arts and letters who will, um, who's interested in taking some photographs? And he said, oh, yeah. And so that's how that happened. Uh, so. But the, the particular focus that I bring to this is we labeled it field of form. And it actually started with stories I collected in Pearl Harbor and Hiroshima. Uh, people who gave us those stories, those precious stories from surviving Pearl Harbor and Hiroshima, almost with, without exception, said to us, I'm going to share this story, but please make sure that other people get the story. Please make sure that you take the story back to the United States. Can you please tell some young people about that story, about what I'm going to tell you, all right? So I, I really took that to heart that I, I meant to continue to, to honor their requests. And I knew that I wasn't going to do it with a publication in Advances in Nursing Science, which is where these data went, which is a fairly high, highly regarded nursing journal. Yep. Um, but I knew that the people who I wanted to reach weren't reading advances in nursing science. Uh, so, you know, generally speaking, it takes somewhere in the area of 17 years to translate research to practice in the discipline of nursing and healthcare generally. 17 years. So things we do in research, findings that we have, 17 years later, you might see them in practice. So this whole idea, Field the Forum, came as a way to say, how can we get to the community more quickly? And that's how the arts came into view, all right? And so I've done that through a documentary theater performance entitled With Their Voices Raised. This was collaborative with Dr. Goodrow Tamahashi, who's my colleague in Japan. And so when, when Andrew start, Andrew's my next door office neighbor, when she started <laughs> talking to me about what she was doing, you photographs <laughs> and so that's yeah you know so that's how it emerged and um, I think sometimes we don't know about those sort of informal processes that happen to make things like this come alive so that's really all I have to share about field forum at this point and I'll be happy to answer any questions along the way perfect I'm back so uh, you know it's interesting how we get things going um, is we were working with a, a, a collaborative partner um, at Holy Cross Hospital, and it was interesting. It's Tiffany's mom called me out of the blue. What a girl! She said, "You live." I heard you like faith community nursing. I said, "Heck, I do." And she said, "Well, Holly, can we do something together?" We started working together, and a health challenge became a focus that we really wanted to work on. And that really links us back to Dr. Lear again, because Dr. Lear does story theory, which is uh, associated with the health challenge. And who knew the health challenge in DC? It's kind of a gnarly subject if you want to look closely at that. We'll pass that one around. And uh, you know, feet aren't my area of interest, and certainly Andrew's as the average nurse practitioner, but how did we come up with the health challenge of feet? Well, uh, a population in Broward County is uh, working with, it's okay, working with a uh, person who's experiencing homelessness. And the number one challenge that they experience is with their feet. And when they go to homeless shelters, one of the 
the number one things that they ask for is socks. And so we have heard through the grapevine of safe communities that there was a hair clinic that was offered um, through a community of faith down in Miami. And all of a sudden, it just was like this explosion of excitement from Ballard, really, and Anna. Could we do it with our group? And that therein became where we uh, decided to do this clinical endeavor to move forward to address a health challenge of feet for people experiencing homelessness. So we developed a foot care clinic and uh, used the folks in Miami to sort of model what we were doing. We went down there, watched how they did it. We amped it up just a little bit because of the expertise that we have as uh, uh, doctor we prepared nurses, the pediatric nurse practitioner, as um, healthcare, our, our partners at Holy Cross, and we um, involved a podiatrist, a PA, nursing students, 125 volunteers. It was amazing how many people we had. If you look around the room, you can see some of these health challenges were quite evident, some were less so, but all of them had their feet washed. All of them were given brand new shoes uh, that fit them, which is pretty exciting. I don't know if it's a good chance mm -hmm. I'll close the personal foot. And, uh, <laughs> and there was this wonderful opportunity for synergy to become part of what we did. Very natural, it wasn't forced. And the more we began exploring the possibility of this foot care clinic, we, we often had little heart palpitations in the hallway because Andrew would say, oh my gosh, this happened, and we got a partner of the Broward Health, Health Department, and we had food donated from uh, oh, socks. Don't forget the, oh, socks. the oh, socks company. Nancy wears really nice socks, they're like eleven dollar socks, and I thought they're about Walmart dollar store socks. These are eleven dollar, eighteen dollar pairs of socks. They have as part of their mission a philanthropic great thing. We wrote them and said, This is what we're doing. They said, Sure, we'll donate 250 pairs of socks. So we had beautiful socks. So the synergy that came was a natural evolution and uh, pretty exciting to be part of, to be honest with you. I think we're on to the next person. So how did we get affiliated with Peace, Justice, and Human Rights? So as Susan described, this started as a political endeavor. It, it did not start as, let's do some research. Yeah. <laughs> It became this sort of snowball effect of, of this clinical endeavor. Um, our final community partners have ended up being last year, and they have all signed on for this year, are um, FAU College of Nursing, Holy Cross Hospital Community Outreach Department, a podiatrist with them, Dr. Pappas, um, Broward Sheriff's Office Homeless Outreach Department, um, and Bombas, and then an organization called um, Hope South Florida, which addresses needs of homeless individuals in Broward County, and one of their sites is Christ Church United Methodist, um, their Pompano campus in um, Pompano Beach, Florida. So those are our community partners. So our Association with Peace, Justice, Human Rights, about the time that this was all evolving, a grant call came out. You know how we get these emails periodically, um, submit for uh, one of the C grants. And so I thought, we look and see what their, their focus are, and one of them was addressing uh, the social inequalities and inclusion, social inclusion, and homelessness was a part of that. And I thought, well, okay, but how, how do we approach this? And um, to be honest with you, I was intrigued with a book that was out called Humans of New York, mm -hmm. and I was intrigued at how a whole story could be told about the life of these individuals through a photograph and one picture. And that's when I went to Pat's office, and it's because I knew she was very, um, that, that her theory was story theory, getting feedback yeah. from her, and then it evolved, as she said, over a conversation, and we found our wonderful friend and colleague, <laughs> collaborator here, um, Nancy, <laughs> whose specialty was visual anthropology, and she absolutely was um, ready to, to jump onto that, and then um, adopting the field of form approach and understanding from the beginning that our data was going to be these visual images. Mm -hmm. um, so it was the natural fit for the Peace, Justice, Human Rights thing, um, the field form approach, that visual images. And unfortunately, at that point in time, we did not get um, funded through that grant mechanism, but they have been very generous 
um, that's helping us move this work forward and uh, the funding to be able to get the exhibit together. The full exhibit is actually six towers. Um, but it's small. I, the ring was a little smart, small to be all six towers. But the full exhibit, which um, can share a little bit more about the field approach, this is the forum. Today here, um, speaking with you guys is the forum. We have a few pictures of the forum that we have uh, several avenues of the forum that we've already done. Um, we've taken it, taken it back to the location where it occurred. And I actually am, have been asked to bring it to an elementary school that's associated with the church that's the host venue. And they have 300 and something students and they're doing a, a shoe drive and classes can win the Golden Shoe Award. <laughs> so that's how we're getting um, a lot of the donations of our shoes this year. And so they asked me to come this Friday, bring the exhibit and talk to the individuals, the, the children there about just raising the awareness of issues of individual homeless and health issues. So it's been exciting how this has all come together and we've been fully supported through Peace, Justice, and Human Rights Initiative. It's been a great partnership. In my notes, Tracy and Andra, it says that um, one of the things we want to be sure to talk about is um, as part of our process, how we went through the IRB in order to have um, informed consent. Because at the bottom of this was we wanted it to be a very ethical research project. Anytime you're dealing with people, you have to be mindful of ethics, but especially when you're dealing with a vulnerable population. So one of the first criteria in the grant that we went to apply for, it said um, interdisciplinary, a collaborative project, which is how we, we brought our two departments together. I'm the token non-medical person on the team. Um, and in anthropology, we're very mindful of um, when you're representing other people's lives, doing it in a very uh, not only ethical way but very sensitive way as to their own worldview the way they would want to be seen so we wrote this up for the irb and we tried to figure out a way where if we're taking someone's photograph how do we do it um, in a way that was sensitive to how they're being represented in situations where they're in um, a potentially vulnerable position maybe they don't want to be identified as homeless, maybe they don't want to be seen in a particular way uh, as taking a, a free handout. We can't make any assumptions, we don't know. So we decided on a color coding scheme. And we, without knowing how many people were going to come, we, we set up a process where we had a sign-in desk at the front door and um, Susan and some help helpers <laughs> set up a table where we put together a, um, an informed consent form that people could sign. And then we thought, well, what if people can't read? So we had to have somebody sit there with every single person who came through, make sure they understood what was going to happen when they came in and see if they agreed to it. If they agreed to have their photo taken while they were in there, they had a green dot. Green dot. Green dot. I'm passing some around so you can see. That's Everyone got a name tag when they came in. Whether you had your name on it or not, you had that tag. And then on the tag, we could put a green dot, which meant full consent. You can take my entire photograph. I'm open to whatever's going to happen inside of there as we explain the process of coming through. Uh, I think it was an orange dot was, you can take my photograph, but do not include my face. Anything from the neck down would be okay. And then red dot, don't want to be in any photographs. Um, this allowed us when we took our data and went through to analyze, we could pull out any of the red dots and make sure that people who um, had asked not to be included were not included in our, in our uh, data set. The next thing we wanted to make sure was that we all had name tags. Whether you were a volunteer, nurse practitioner, photographer, whoever you were, a uh, church member, we all wore name tags so that no one population was singled out. Um, and I think that was enough to get us through the IRB process. They were okay with that. I think that was all that we uh, did in, in terms of that. The data collection 
and analysis process. I wanted to just take a few minutes in my segment to talk about the role of the visual. We know that good field work, no matter what discipline we're in, benefits from a variety of methodologies and processes because the broader we approach we can take, uh, the more types of information we can get back. In anthropology, we start by observing a site. We do observation, participant observation, and we take copious notes. We become very good at writing. Um, we speak to people. We want to garner their perspective of whatever it is that we're investigating. We want to get an idea of what they believe about the world. And we observe them to see what they actually do in that space. And we take all this data back with us and we look it over and we analyze it. We try to find some way to interpret it, to find relationships among the sets of data um, and find out what kind of connections or patterns emerge from the data. Then we maybe produce some kind of written report, as Susan was saying, maybe go into a journal. Um, in anthropology, we call this an ethnography. So now if we add in a visual aspect, starting from step one, going back to step one, what does a visual bring to that? Well, it's interesting. Um, in the field work, when we're out in the field, if we use visual methodologies, um, we can observe and record using photographs. I mean, nowadays, anybody who has an iPhone, um, there's moving images as well as still, we can use visuals in all sorts of ways to collect the data. If we use the visual in analyzing, which is what we did, we used it for collecting and also for analyzing, um, we can interpret and disseminate in a whole new way. And voila, you have a visual ethnographic project. What happened in our situation was, we started out with over 500 photographs. We went back to um, a room and sat down and put it up on the projector and went through all 500 and some of the photographs. We thought, okay, well, that's a lot of photographs. What are we going to do with this? And Nancy doesn't like to, to let go of any photographs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. First and foremost, I'm not a photographer. Everybody always says, oh, you must be a photographer and that's why you like doing it. And no, I don't have a background in art. I'm not a professionally trained photographer. And in anthropology, it, it isn't necessary because the data is raw data and really that's why you end up with so many photographs. You're really just documenting the processes. You're documenting the rituals. You're documenting people's experiences. So you're documenting everything. It's like, you know, being at your kid's birthday party or something, right? You just want to take it all in. So we decided we better figure out a system to go through the photographs and decide what it is we're looking for and what we want to select. So we went from the 581, I think we rolled down to about 250 that first time round by figuring out which things we were gonna pull out, starting by eliminating all the bad photographs so we couldn't see anything. Although some of those came back in eventually because we liked the blurry images that showed um, the action that was going on. Then from the 250, I think we got down to 125 because we wanted to make a slideshow to take back to the population uh, that we could share with them. And we did another um, uh, food event with them. And we had another uh, big meal together. So we wanted to show them what we found. But then we also wanted to do some kind of a display. And I think we whittled it down to around um, Maybe it was all 125 that we had printed out to in small form to put on the tables for people to take with them. And then uh, I think it was 50 that we wanted to put on display. We just did a, a seat for, we just put them up there while everybody was having their meal. We encouraged people to come through and take a look at them. And these were a lot of people who were in the photographs. And then we sat there with our clipboards, taking our notes and um, talking to them about which ones they liked, why they liked them. And then eventually we whittled it down to uh, 25 that we wanted to have for our own purposes uh, to show people. But to not go into too much detail about how all that um, added to our data set, 
the important thing was we went in with a healthcare research project and we came out with um, a different set of outcomes. We came out with um, noticing human connection, compassion, dignity, things that hadn't be, been apparent at the beginning and came out after we looked through the visual data. What we saw was lots of examples um, like this, lots of um, sharing stories, lots of um, um, care and, um, and friendship and and it was just a whole, a whole nother level. When health research and visual methods combine, the metaphor and the visual, um, it's been used in the past for all sorts of medical information. But what we found when producing visual material and doing visual analysis, um, the outcomes can really help to change our ways of thinking about things. We found that for the nurses and the doctors who were participating, um, it gave them an opportunity to hear stories, which takes us back to Pat's initial thoughts on um, the value of stories in, in nursing and health in general. It improves communication and um, relationships between the various interacting communities really changed. Um, Andrew, if we have time, maybe we could share a couple of the stories that came out of this that floored us, where volunteers stepped up or people from uh, the various populations told us things that we had never anticipated that became outcomes uh, from doing our project. Um, and I think that's about it from, uh, from what I wanted to show. Oh, and one last thing, which you want, I can wait until we talk about the, uh, the more of the forum about where we took it, but Andrew and Susan came to one of my classes and we put this up and we presented it to the classes. And I will just tell you that the bottom line, from the beginning of the class, when we asked the students about their impressions of um, the homeless population and to tell us a little bit about their perspective of how they see people experiencing homelessness and the kinds of words and concepts that they associated with homeless people versus at the end of our presentation, and we had them go back and revisit that idea to see if anything had changed after seeing our pre our photos and listening to our stories. They completely shifted the way they thought about um, people experiencing homelessness. It went from homeless to, to people. And they began to see this vulnerable population as um, fellow human beings. So it's proved to be very powerful for us. I just wanted to also say in the textbook that uh, somebody has one going around, it, uh, there's a chapter, uh, chapter nine, page 187, actually goes through the eight step process we use for um, determining what photographic images we would explore for. We reveal our secrets in there. Yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah, we did. So, so one of the beautiful things about this as well, since we are in academia, um, is our ability to have involved students in the process. Um, we, on that particular day, and we actually have even more numbers this year that we're going to be involved with, 23 RNVs and nursing students who provided the first level of care to the actual people you see washing the feet or laying the bills, <laughs> who felt um, compassion to be able to help other people in that way. But those you actually see providing the care were RNs and BSN students. If there was an issue that was identified, and you've seen some of those that you can imagine as sort of that next level of care, we had um, two medical students, for instance, um, this wound uh, was actually to the bone on this individual. Um, and so those type of things that were identified, there would be more than you could would think, were referred to the next level of care, and we had four higher level um, providers. This year, we're going to be able to incorporate our own nurse practitioner students. So we're going to provide a higher level of care um, under the supervision of a podiatrist. So it may not be an area that they've had a lot of, um, of experience in. We also have five evidence-based research nurse or um, MSN master's degree students who are going to be helping us administer a couple of scales um, questionnaires 
this idea of human connection that really was the main thing that evolved from this work. There was a human connection scale that was developed with oncology patients and oncologists that we have gotten permission to adapt. We had to adapt some of the language appropriate to our population and our care providers. And we are going to be testing uh, the validity of that with this population that this year's event when we have five master's degree research students who are going to come and help us with that. And then we're really excited. If you can go to Emily's picture. We have um, Dr. Lear connected us with, she um, is one of the faculty for our honors, BSN honors program. And we have been connected with a BSN honors student who actually is embracing this work, a piece of this work, to make it her honors project. And she's already been involved with us. She's actually going to be doing a linguistic analysis of people's perceptions of people experiencing homelessness before they ex experience an exhibit like this um, and after and to see if there is a change in perception through a linguistic analysis approach just based on the forum piece of this um, she was very interested in how arts intersect with health um, and this happens to be i think kind of the closest thing that was associated with arts within the college of nurses at this time Nancy had alluded to some of the stories that came out of this that were very powerful in what people shared with us, both on the care provider end, that was a story that was shared with me where someone was buying a whole lot of shoes in Target for the donations, and somebody behind her asked her, did your husband go through shoes really fast? And she explained that she, what she was buying it for, what the shoes were being donated for, and the lady took several pair of the shoes out of her that buggy and said, I want to buy those. I used to be homeless. Mm -hmm. And it was such a powerful moment for her that she didn't even know anybody involved, but she heard the story and wanted to be involved. There was another lady who um, has some significant mental illness and um, is homeless and was a part of this, was at one of the clinics, the Life Net Clinic the next week and was sharing with the nurse her experience. And it was descriptions like, I haven't been touched in a long time. People were willing to, to, they weren't afraid of us, they were willing to touch us, and several people, their comments were, they just treated us like human beings. Human beings. Um, and so it, it really was, um, it's very powerful anecdotal stories. When we collected the data of why they were their favorite pictures, almost all of them had to do with human connection. This was one of their favorite ones. And it said, they're just happy and they seem to be enjoying each other so much. Um, or, I like that one because they're looking into each other's eyes. They're willing to look at them. Or, I, they're willing to, to touch them. So, almost all of it, that's how that whole concept of human connection um, is a thing that emerged. Yeah. Both through our analysis and what the, the community <coughs> told of us as well. If you look into so many pictures even deeper. We, we studied them for a while, but I mean, the people even watching the feet, they were all in. They, they, there was no, you know, these are really grimy uh, feet that uh, sometimes had shoes that didn't fit. They were dirty. Um, and these people were all, all in, uh, you know, this. We you know, actually even had to implement a new protocol this yeah. year for the, the washing part, the lay individuals that are washing feet. There were certain people that did not want to give up their chair. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they would not leave their, their foot washing chair. And some people who wanted that experience were not able to have that experience. So we've had to devise a new process this year um, to allow everybody that wants to, to care for others in that way um, to do that. And we had some of the people in the homeless population volunteer too. Yes. Yeah. I think, it, you know, as this project has evolved, it's been pretty exciting because I don't, I again stress that we didn't start off to do. Uh, images of persons experiencing homelessness in the feet. It was something that came really organically from the willingness to be open, um, really based in principles of um, participatory action research, where you walk into a situation without an agenda and you're open to what is necessary. And, you know, starting with Valerie uh, with Holy Cross, reaching out to me, working with them, doing some educational events. And this has evolved over two to three years. 
um, it's become just a real beautiful expression of researchers learning as well as the, the folks learning. They're teaching us, we're learning, students are learning. Um, there, there's so much that has come from this field to forum uh, that I, that I, I, I would just uh, say that I'm, I'm just very honored to be part of it and uh, to see how it just continues to grow. And uh, this year we're doing it again. <laughs> and it's, um, it's, it's, we see the strength of collaborative work. Sure. Mm -hmm. the, the, the faith community venue that hosted would like for us to do this. Um, what's a quarter? Mm -hmm. As you can imagine, it, it takes quite a bit of resources to pull that much together. And so what we have to do at this point is once a year. But I also want to underscore when we originally saw, you know, we're nurses, we're healthcare educators, you know, we walked into the first observation of the beautiful things that were happening down in Miami and we were horrified they weren't using gloves you know like oh what did you mean we got her gloves I don't know if you don't yeah you do yeah you do so uh you know just those types of perspectives used you know wisdom it does take time we the tool that we found for the RNBSM students to use as an assessment was a very simple uh but helpful tool and then it also has the red, yellow, green. Uh, green, go forward. You don't have to worry about it. It's perfect. These are perfectly reasonable feet. Yellow, question if you aren't sure, maybe ask your instructor. Red, send it on up to the next level. And there were some real clear assessment guidelines so that we wouldn't miss. Not that some of those things were uh, would be missed, but I think that the incorporation of some you know, professional guidelines and evidence that we have really uh, weaved through that has been very exciting. And I don't, I don't think it would come together so uh, reasonable if we didn't have the collaboration. And some of this, I think, is if you don't know it, you don't know it, you don't know it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> we initially, um, in our proposal for yeah. the grant, had envisioned a, because we were getting these socks from the Bombas company, who has been very gracious to give us your socks just to have different houses, 250 pair of socks. So if you would need to buy socks, um, <laughs> yes, we're putting a plug in for Bombas. <laughs> um, but the initial idea was to have a sock um, cleaning program. There's a washer and dryer at this venue. So the idea was for them to have their own pair of socks to be able to bring back weekly to have them laundered and get their own socks back, just that sense of dignity that this is something that is mine. Um, what we didn't know that we didn't know that we didn't know it is all the ways that we need to work in these socks. Um, and not to be too graphic, but if they don't have toilet paper, um, they will all resort to using socks. Um, and, and female who is on her initial period will often use socks since she doesn't have access to very um, type of items. And so it got to be more of a health issue than we had the capability to really wrap our heads around in that type of process. We were afraid of the health risk of trying to launder those socks and see what, what people might bring us in um, because it was going to be laundering them all together. And we just decided that that really was not equal. Um, one of the things that Broward County Hope South Florida, who is a community partner, has this year that they're going to be bringing as well as a shower truck. Mm -hmm. um, and so they are using that to add to. Yeah, and we're trying to also incorporate another level of assessment. Uh, we'll have some R and BSN students doing blood pressures. So still trying to work that out. Still trying to work that out. But we do have the Holy Cross in partnership with uh, Community Outreach Department uh, uh, resources for social services, and we had a table set up because a lot of people came and had way more issues than uh, what we were prepared to address with, uh, uh, you know, the foot care. And so, so the individual was still, um, he really needed to go to the hospital that day. You could not, you could not convince him to go. But at least had those social services there available to try to get them the resources that they needed. Yeah, and they provided uh, information about you know where to go tomorrow in case uh, they needed to have primary care assistance. Um, so it, it, there was a number of levels where um, I think the professional approach 
the community collaboration, the work among colleagues, and the willingness to be open to the possibilities we're really very excited to be part of. I think a challenge for us moving forward is well, there is an insurance, no medical insurance system for homeless individuals that's very funded within Broward County. Um, but it's very, it's, it's challenging to navigate. And you have to have a homeless affidavit. So you have to have a place that you can actually get a homeless affidavit, but then you can take it to this organization um, and then you can get health insurance for a year. You can get both primary care and then if you need a specialist, you can apply for a higher level of insurance and actually be able to see a specialist. Um, it's difficult to get compliance with individuals who are living in homelessness to use those systems. Um, so I think there's a lot of work going forward. I think even partnering with hospitals and emergency departments is really trying to seek most of their care and how through opportunities like this, we're able to coach them through how to appropriately use health care, not just for the cost that it is, but for them to get that ongoing care that they need and that follow up that they need where they have a medical home and someone is actually caring for their home. And bringing the awareness to the student nurses of what of looking beyond the face, looking beyond the surface when when treating people who are in the vulnerable positions. Uh, real surprising, you know, the uh, the sense of for me, I you know it's not my necessarily my population feet really not my thing either, but um, but the, being open to that, learning about the experience of being homeless. Uh, they, some of them have chosen that lifestyle. Um, when you begin to speak with them, they, they want to live in that lifestyle. There are, are you know, lots of trust issues that they have with being um, connected with uh, systems and organizations. Um, you know, it, it, it's a tremendous, you know, talk about peace, justice, uh, human rights, but it's, it's a tremendous learning opportunity, um, uh, much deeper than I think that I ever anticipated. So, um, we'll see. Real, you know, real yeah. briefly, and then we'll open it up for yeah. questions. Some of the other findings that came through our data analysis, mm -hmm. what do you see here? I hope you can see it here. Edema. Oh, edema. So you're on their feet all the time, but Sun exposure. Yeah. Sun exposure. Um, another was one here. One of the things that we didn't anticipate at all, I think we probably could have if we thought about it all that, we could have thought about sun exposure. The concept of waiting right here up on the third screen. This one. Numerous pictures that emerged that, that we could see. And all their belongings are with them. And every time they go from what we had stations set up, you know, check-in station. First station, get your feet washed, then get your foot sized, look at, they pick up three and four bags and go to the next station. Like a little suitcase, a little backpack, little, yeah, all with them. So with them, but then this whole idea, how much do we like to wait? We don't, we're, we're in a, we want things right now sort of mentality in our society and really thinking about how much waiting when you are dependent on other people for everything mental health effect of waiting to have on them. Um, another was how many people have ambulation issues. Multiple people there with pain, can you see pain in that one? Walkers, wheelchairs. Um, so all of the ambulation issues on our data assessment form that the RNDSN students did, one of the questions was what are your challenges in caring for your own feet? Often it was joint issues. Like they have back problems and they can't bend over to even get their socks on. So they were flip-flop type of shoes because that's all they can get on. Cutting their toenails. I believe this is, we have this one here because I believe this was the individual that his toenails wrapped all the way around his toe. Mm -hmm. um, and it was making it really difficult for him to walk. But they're so thick that even if they could have gotten a hold of a pair of slippers, they would not have been able to put their own nails. Things we take for granted. Mm -hmm. We can't see well enough to cut their toenails. We don't have toenail clippers, obviously. It's some were on the weight, they couldn't bend mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm with you, uh, I think you don't mind, maybe, uh, 
opportunity to ask the first question. The first thing I think is that as you're approaching this next iteration, um, we, uh, you know, in, in, in HSS Human Rights, we start to partner with you and find ways that we could, could partner both uh, in terms of either human resources, financial resources, or other resources as well. So that will be a conversation I'd love to follow up with you on. Because I think that, at least from my perspective, this is really an example of what I think the initiative should be striving to do, which is combining, uh, you know, research with a community-based approach uh, on things that really resonate both here in, uh, you know, South Florida, as you were referring to the book that was stuck in uh, like New York City, which is also there which has also been done in lots of different locations internationally, this, this is an international issue. Um, and uh, so I, I'd love to be able to, for us to have some follow-on discussions in the future. Um, let me ask um, uh, just a couple of um, uh, questions in terms of kind of research uh, aspect. Uh, so, um, so Nancy, you were, you were discussing, for instance, ethnography and uh, using this observer uh, methodology. And I'm curious is um, uh, for any of, of uh, the uh, contributors to the project, how you felt that uh, introducing the visual uh, changed the dynamic of the project in terms of uh, how did that, you think, impact uh, individuals uh, in terms of either these sorts of foundational emotional issues you've discussed, um, the connections, the humanity that they feel by photographing them, that that enhanced it. I'm just very curious as to how did the visual impact, because I, my view is it had to have had some form of an impact in terms of the way people thought of themselves. Of course, since I you saw know. you, and then in terms of the essence of having a camera there. It's a, it, absolutely, just the, the, simple, the, the simple process of introducing that sort of a component to this sort of, of healthcare delivery, how does that change healthcare delivery? Would be first question, just second. Okay. And then the second question um, is again, going back to, to, to Pat's discussion about field reform. And, and for all of us as researchers, one of our biggest regrets is that our empirical findings sometimes take literally generations before they actually have an impact. Um, and uh, maybe to kind of reflect upon ultimately um, using this field to form approach. How, what are you hoping to impact? Uh, I mean, because here I can see both, I can see again a very rich empirical work being done, but I also can see with the visual connectivities to the community that should change mindsets. Um, and uh, that ultimately by changing the mindset, you really unleash really the power of the community to change the dynamic of homelessness itself. Um, and so um, I, I'd just be curious to reflect a little bit about about the methodology that underpins this entire research project as well. So those would be my. Well, I think it's impossible to capture countenance. I, I, that's a, um, the, this image right here is such a, a, a capture that I, I, I mean, even when they were there that day, I didn't, I didn't capture it. It's captured in a photographic image. That's a joyful comments. That's good. They were friends. It would never have been in a written report. No, and I wouldn't pick up on it necessarily. But um, going through numerous, there, there was uh, um, uh, there was a, a gentleman. We also had hairstylists. We didn't mention the other hairstylist. A man who came in. He looked really shaggy and just kind of dirty, and you know, with big beautiful eyes. And so we started talking and. By the end of the day, I mean, he seemed a little forlorn, you know, when we had to sign up for this because I can't get my own food. By the end of the day, he had a new pair of shoes, he had an haircut, he had a big meal in front of him, he was going to town. And literally, it changed from that. And I don't know if we did, you know, we didn't video him, but that experience for me is really profound. The, the word of, I, uh, they treated me like I was human. I mean, that brings tears to my eyes still. That's amazing. That's a human being saying, what did you like best about it? They treat me like I was human. Wow. Huh? Well, I think a couple of things going to your first question. Um, I, I was, well, Susan was sort of in a place. I was sort of all over the place, and she she was capturing voters. Nancy's just presence of, of calmness and um, gentleness, I think coupled with being very intentional about the consent process. Um, 
and the fact that there were 400 people, <laughs> 400 <laughs> plus people in a place that wasn't huge. Um, a lot of times, I don't think people even knew Nancy was there um, taking the photographs. Um, I watched her several times if it was going to be more of an up close intimate photograph, even though we had consent, she would do at the point of your consent. So is it okay if I capture this? Um, so I did not feel that anybody was really, I don't remember me saying that, we had very few that wanted a red sticker, we had very few that wanted a yellow sticker. They wanted to take it. They wanted, they didn't necessarily want their name to be documented, but they didn't want to take it. And so Nancy can probably speak more to the conversations around the pictures that they were in. Well, I, I think um, you both hit the nail on the head, and people were intensely involved. And if you look at the photographs, no one's paying attention to the camera. They're all very involved in what they were going, their own personal experience. We chose to leave some of these pictures in because this is how fast the day was. Um, yeah. It was, um, we felt like this just captured, we were exhausted after the end of the, the, the five hours. <laughs> So, yeah, can I just, I want to just address one more piece of uh, Dr. Roper's question, and it, it has to do with, I think, the idea that what you're seeing now as presented a forum is essentially an intervention, all right? So it has the potential as forum to change people's perspectives, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's kind of the piece that, for instance, the, the undergraduate honor student is studying, and I know you're going to be studying that as well, is the idea of, you know, what are people's views before about homelessness? And then what, and then having them experience this, what, what are their views after? So, yeah, I think that once it gets to forum, it becomes an intervention. I found that with my Pearl Harbor version of work as well, is that once you get to the in our case, it's a performance. Once we got there, now, you know, we can actually assess how people can change their perspectives and, and how such a forum promotes understanding. Okay. That's the underlying thing about I love how you express that whole idea of creating ease. Creating ease is part of story theory. So the idea, but in the, in the case of Field the Forum work, I think that I think that, again, forums enable understanding, cross-cultural understanding, and I would say that homelessness, coming from homelessness, is a cross-cultural understanding. It's a culture that, mm -hmm. that maybe some of you have lived it. I have not lived it, so I don't necessarily understand it. But in looking at this, I can say, well, I have a, a little bit of understanding. And the ideas that you all came out of from doing the qualitative analysis of the photograph, the idea of connection, you know, and the importance of that, you know, I have a little bit of better understanding. So, yeah, I think that, um, so the theory is, story theory suggests that, that, you know, uh, story is a narrative event of connecting with another. And in that process, connecting broader with your world and with yourself. And, and, and if you can do that, you can be more at ease. So again, theoretically, so we, it's all connected to a theoretical perspective and to a knowledge foundation that we haven't spent a lot of time talking about today, but in, they in, lived that, it. <laughs> they but lived in it. that, that is why we took the 50 photographs back to that community exactly. because we wanted them to be able to tell their story. We didn't want it to be fully our interpretation of their story, but we wanted them to tell the story that they wanted people to know. And by, and by choosing the photographs that they that they value, they told their story. You know, we could get their story. But I think you have a question. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to ask, I noticed from the photographs I've seen mostly um, adults as part of the population. Did you target a specific age group, or did you guys have other people who are homeless? We did well? have some children there. Um, I don't know that we have any. I, I tried not to think about them. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, were we also, we had kids volunteering. We had children volunteering, a lot of um, teenage age. Um, children volunteering. 
And we did have a few homeless families yeah. who were there as well with young children. There's something very spiritual about watching people's feet and as well as the whole theory and practice that is coming from this, there is this whole spiritual energy as well. And I was wondering if you all touched upon that or... We did. This was at a faith community. It was a Christian faith community and they asked if we could do it on Palm Sunday, which mm -hmm. has significant meaning for that faith um, tradition. Mm -hmm. and, probably a reason that we got 125 volunteers <laughs> because they wanted to live out their faith and compassion in that way. Uh, they've asked us again for this year and can host it on Palm Sunday. So it will be the week before the Sunday before Easter. It also is, is part of the special practice of Asian University, which mm -hmm. has as its central dimension the spiritual dimension, mm -hmm. even though there are other dimensions that are explored. Uh, it also works closely with the community outreach department slash faith community nursing department at Holy Cross Hospital. So that, that's where the collaboration really began two years before. Mm -hmm. so that's what I'm saying. We're like, let's do something really exciting. What should we do? Wow. And then all of a sudden, it was like this, this came to us. We were like, let's do something really neat together. What could it be? You know, And that's part of community-based participatory action and certainty are open to it. And my agenda wasn't working with a population of persons experiencing homelessness or feet. Um, I can't underscore that enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't underscore that enough. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I think that's one of the things that we talked about. We wanted to kind of open up. We took a risk. This was not really a focus of research for any of us, but we took a risk and um, saw the opportunity at FAU to connect something with the priorities of FAU um, and really re-envision what we were doing. And yeah. imagine that, that was, yeah, that reimagining what you can do with your research as you connect with the platforms and pillars. And I think that that's part of where it happened for us was, you know, we're doing, we're in the middle of doing something. We're doing it with or without funding pretty much. And then this call came out and Andrew was like, oh, maybe. It, and then we connected with a uh, platform. And uh, how could you reimagine your research, the work that you do, to connect not just with peace, justice, human rights, but why not, right? I just want to congratulate you all on such a beautiful project. This just touches my heart on so many levels. And as I was listening to you, I just thought about so much more than Something that came to mind is using feet as a pathway to health. You know, because when you work with vulnerable populations, I think every encounter is an opportunity to really address so the bigger concept of health. And when you think about health, you know, that's so much more than just the absence of disease. Sure. You know, just this human connectedness that you talked about. And we're going to give these individuals this sense of being human again. Yeah. You know, and, and achieving health. I think that is so powerful and amazing. And um, in terms of the research aspect, I'm just wondering if you all have thought about doing some longitudinal analysis of this to say, you know, can we track these individuals? I know it's, it's challenging. It